Genesis chapter 12, and I'll begin reading in verse number 1, and my thought today is on the seed of faith. Verse 1 says that the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, I, in studying and reading out the, this, uh, man, that's exciting stuff, right? When God blesses. Amen. Anybody excited about that? Lord, bless me. And the Lord says, I'm going to, I'm going to bless you and multiply. And, and uh, you hear a lot of encouraging messages like that, right? Lord, oh yeah, the Lord's going to bless you. He's going to multiply you. And people can just be shouting and carrying on and just, whoo, that was the greatest message I've ever heard in my life. Continue reading on further down. Verse number 10, the Bible says, And at that time a severe sa uh, uh, famine struck the land of Canaan, forcing Abraham to go down to Egypt, where he lived as a foreigner. We get caught up in the blessings and not realize that God can make promises to you, but that doesn't mean, amen, that you're not going to go through something. And as I began to reread this chapter again, it just kind of popped out at me. God, yes, you perform blessings and man, we get excited about it. But what, what about the times when all of a sudden we're dealing with a famine? And the Lord's like, and you've got to be flexible. Sometimes we could get so stuck up on our little blessings that we think that we can't be flexible to the moving of God. And God's like, yes, Yes, I'm going to bless you, but you need to be flexible in the midst of it. Yes, I'm going to bless you, but when famine strikes, Abraham had to go to Egypt where there was food. Why would God allow a famine come into a land that he just called uh, Abraham to? He promised blessings to him. It was a test of Abraham's faith. And Abraham passed the test. He didn't question God in, in, in leading when he was faced with, with difficulty. And so many times that is us. God has promised us, but when we face difficulties, we, we just want to throw up our hands and quit. And give up. And God's like, it's just a test. I want to see, will you be flexible? Will you be flexible? Now that's not my, my topic today, but as I went back to, to listen to the Bible again this morning, that was the thought that came. Will you be flexible? We want the blessings, absolutely. But what about when there is a famine? What about when you have to go to some place you don't want to go to? Amen. Well, hallelujah anyway. I guess I'll just preach to myself today. Thank you. Thank you for attending. <laughs> Amen. Chapter 15, this is where my thought topic is going to come from. And chapter 15, verse 1, Sometime later the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision. Sometime later, I want you to note that. And said to him, Do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you, and, and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied, O oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, uh, Eleazar of Damascus, a servant in my household, when, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, and none, and so, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir. For you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abraham outside. I want you to highlight that mentally or whatever. The Lord took him outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham believed the Lord. And the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Amen. Are you thankful for the word of the Lord today? Can you say amen? I've come today to talk to some of us. 
Some of us who just feel like we are just settling in life. Going through the mundane. Going through the rat race. Anybody feel like that? You just kind of like, you kind of get caught up where all of a sudden just, it just feels like everything's just boring. Nothing's moving in my life. And Lord, uh, I don't know where that you are. And maybe sometimes we have believed God for his blessings and we get stuck for many years not seeing those blessings. If I, am I coming to minister to anybody today? Amen. If not, then I'm just going to minister to myself because they said a preacher's greatest message is when he preaches to himself. <laughs> Amen. And so, I don't know about you today, but many of us, we can get caught up. We can, we can spend a lot of time getting caught up and just waiting for that promise, for that blessing. Oh, can you, can you say with me today, especially some people are like, oh, I pray the Jabez prayer. Lord, I want you to enlarge my, my territory. I want you to, to bless me. Lord, I want you to use me in a phenomenal way. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? Lord, I just want to be used by you. I'm waiting. I'm believing. I, I'm going to see a miracle. How many times you've walked out of church saying that? I believe it's coming my way. And Monday morning rolls around you and you feel like you just took 30 steps back. You know, it's, you, you believe it. You feel it. And all of a sudden you just, you find yourself like, Lord, I don't understand. And so you get to a point that you finally say, you know what? I'll just settle. I'll settle and I'll just, I'll just settle for anything. Oh yeah, it's. The single girls, can you, uh, and ladies, do not, do not raise your hands. Do not say amen when I say this statement. But there's a lot of girls that I know that, they, man, they are believing for a man. And they're believing for a man of God. They're like, Lord, you know, and you boys that are here today, you can pray the same prayer about a girl. But, you know, I, I've heard girl, Lord, he's going to give me, the Lord's going to bless me with a man who's six foot tall, muscular, buff. He's going to be a man that loves Jesus. He's going to be a provider. He's going to be an incredible dad. He's going to have the, the best humor. He's going to love to travel. He's going to make me breakfast in bed. He's going to love, you know, chick flicks with me. He's going to, he's going, you have it set in your mind and you believe it and you pray for it and it doesn't happen. Five years later, you're believing, you're praying, Lord, you're going to do it for me. And finally, you get to a point you just want to settle. Lord, I'm believing you for a man, but you know what? I'll just take a male at this point. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take someone who's just even breathing, Lord. I'll, I'll just take, if he's got a job, you know what? That will be a great blessing at this point. I'm just looking, you know, it's humor, but we've heard people pray those kinds of prayers and believe those kinds of things. You know, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to start a business so I can glorify you and I can just give you out of the abundance. So we go through life and we struggle. We can't get a business to, to get going. And so you're like, you know what? I'll just settle for any kind of job. I'll just settle with a job that can at least pay my my insurance or help just pay my pay my rent. I'll just just settle. Amen. I'm gonna be the greatest dad ever to my kids. I'm gonna be there for them for everything. I'm gonna read books to them every single night. I'm gonna tell them bedtime bedtime stories. I'm going to I'm gonna be the best parent ever to my kids. And then you wanna and then some of us have prayed the prayers, Lord, help me not to kill them. We have things that we get stuck in our mind, and it's different from reality. And that's where we can get to a point that for those of us who may have, you know, lowered our expectations, Lord, I know what I felt like, but I'll just settle. I'll just lower my expectations of what God can do. You have no idea what God may produce through a single seed planted in faith. A single seed. Just one seed of faith. You have no idea. And that's exactly where it comes in our story today. Abraham had no idea of one single seed of faith. What that would turn into. Abraham and Sarah, they were hurting. 
They're, they didn't have any children. They're, they're up in age. Probably a lot wiser to have children up in age. There's more patience that happen. Well, that's what some people say. I haven't been there yet. Although, some of our friends are still having kids. And I notice it's a little bit different when you're older. You do have some patience with them. But also, I think financially, you're just a little bit different with it. But Abraham and Sarah, they're hurting. They wanted a baby. They couldn't conceive Sarah sees everybody else. All the other girls are posting on Instagram how they're popping babies out right and left. Sarah's being invited to other baby showers constantly. And every time she gets the invite, it does something within her that says, what in the world, God? Here I am, barren. It's a disgrace. Everybody else is having this. And Lord, what about me? Where are you, God? I have made drastic prayers. I have given you everything, Lord. I have remained faithful unto you, God. I haven't even missed church, as we would say. I haven't, I, God, I haven't. And there's people, ladies and gentlemen, that will step up their giving, especially when people get, when their family members get pregnant. I've had people personally tell me, man, I, I don't want God to give me any curse. And so they're, they're I call it a legalistic mindset. They'll say, I'm going to make sure I give and I'm faithful because I don't want nothing to happen to my baby. Legalistic mindset. I've had people personally tell me those things. And as soon as their baby comes out and the baby's good, it all drops off. That's a legalistic mindset that says it's a works base that God, I'm going to do so you can do for me. Besides stepping out in faith, believing and trusting in Him. And so here they are. Where are you, God? And in Genesis chapter 12, I mean, they leave home. They go to a land that God says, I'm going to show you. If you'll step out in faith, believing, I'm going to tell you something. That is harder uh, to do. Just to step out like Lord. Lord says, come on, I want you to come. You're like, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, this is comfort. Leave everything behind. And so it is, a, he said, I'm going to take you to a land. I'm going to show you. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. You will be the father of nations. You're going to have children and grandchildren. And, and those grandchildren, you're going to have multiple grandchildren, uh, Abraham. I'm going to make of you a great nation. And I could just see when they receive the promise in Genesis chapter 12, I could just see them, they start picking out baby names. I can start seeing the excitement. Like finally, the Lord made a promise. Well, if He made a promise, I'm going to start preparing. I'm going to prepare for the blessing. I'm going to prepare for the promise. And so they start preparing. Uh, no doubt in their own tent. You know, they start like, well, it's time to do an expansion. We're going to have to enlarge our tent. Enlarge our territory. And make room for our baby. What's our nursery theme going to be about this time? If it's a boy or if it's a girl, what are we going to pick out? And so no doubt Sarah even read through that weekend the book of what to expect when you are expecting. She read it cover to cover immediately because being excited about the promise of God. They're planning their Instagram reel. That they're going to pop it off and show whether it's blue or pink. But God made a promise to give us children. The Bible lets us tell you that that time went on. We read that from Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 and 2 where we read in our, uh, in our text today. But one month goes by. In Genesis chapter 12 from the promise, two months goes by. Nothing. Three months Nine months, 12 months goes by, 16 months goes by, 24 months go by. Now it's year after year that goes by. They had the promise and we're years down the road. And then we find where in Genesis chapter 12, he tells him, he said, I'm going to make you a father of nations. I read that in your hearing, chapter 12. I'm going to make of you a father of nations. And then I told you to mentally note in Genesis chapter 15, he says, and sometime later. I'm going to make you sometime later. We hate this part. We hate that sometime later. 
Sometime later, the, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said, Don't be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all my blessings when I don't even have a son? What good is it? I, I, yes, I'm blessed. I've got more than I can handle. I mean, Lord, we're so beyond blessed that Lot and I had to break up. Because we had so many blessings. I'm blessed, but I still have not received the promise. And so it is believed that it could have been possibly even longer, depending on what commentator you read, but probably over a decade between, between chapter 12 and chapter 15. Over 10 years from the Lord making a promise and some time later. Over 10 years of still waiting. Lord, what about what you said 10 years ago about this promise? A decade, more than a decade of an unfulfilled promise. Every month, disappointed. Sarah, you pregnant yet? No, I'm not. 120 months later, month after month, how many of us would give up on God? We quit. Ten years later, Lord never gave me a promise. So you know what? He's, he lied to me. I can't get up there and shout about how God is a provider and He's a way maker and all those kinds of things. I can't get up there and do that any longer because He promised me something over a decade ago and I have not even seen a ray of hope yet. And so I am stuck right here in an unfulfilled promise. He promised, oh yes, I believe that, that my dad would be saved. And yet my dad's more evil today than he was back then. I was waiting for my spouse to, 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 to commit themselves unto God. And yet they're more evil today than they ever have been. I've been praying for that, for that spouse. And Lord, here I am. I've been praying for that job and believing and trusting in you, God. And yet, where is it? I'm still, still out here you know, searching. I'm just stuck in this life. God, did you forget about me? Or you can ask this question. Maybe I just didn't hear him right. Maybe I just didn't hear him right. Or, God, are you really there? Are you really there? I know I've heard it preached many times that you're there, but God, I don't feel you. I don't hear you. I, I don't understand when I hear other people say that they hear the audible voice of God. God, I haven't heard that. Are you really, are you really there? And yet from Abraham's point of view, nothing is happening. From his human perspective, absolutely nothing is happening. And so what happens? They lower their expectation because nothing is happening. And because somebody lowered their expectation, we have a mess on our hands today. Because Sarah says, well, maybe, maybe God meant this, Abraham. I love going back to read that story. Isn't it so cool how things kind of hit you again? Sarah said, Abraham, why don't you just go sleep with my handmaiden? So, you know, he sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. And now the, the, the handmaiden turns on Sarah. And what does Sarah do? She turns on her husband. It's your fault. Isn't it funny how, how we human nature are? Amen. No tall men today. If your wife tells you something to do, make sure you also pray about it. Ladies, when, God, when the man tells you what to do too, make sure you pray about it. We don't need finger pointing back going on. But that's exactly, it kind of humored me to think, Sarah, you told Abraham to do something. Abraham did it, and yet they were conceived a baby. And now Sarah wants to go back and point her finger at Abraham and say, it's your fault. Well, maybe you didn't find humor, but I sure did this morning again. And so they lowered their expectations. See, they had no idea what God can do through a single seed 
and faith. In this life, we all, we all think about God. We think about blessings. We, we tend to all think a lot about additions. You know, they always say that God adds and He multiplies. Satan always subtracts and he divides. I had to learn something in Sunday school. And so we always think about addition, but God always thinks about a multiplication. He told us in Genesis, in the very beginning, he told them to be what? Fruitful and multiply. Jesus even talked about it in the New Testament. He, he, he talks about a, a seed. And he said that the sower went to sow out some seed. And the sower sowed seed that ends up producing some 30 times, some 60 times, and sometimes even 100 times over. It was about, you did something, but I can multiply what you've done. See, no, we have no idea what God can do through a single seed that's planted in faith. It's one, but out of that, God can multiply. God can make things bigger, and He can make things greater than what you and I could ever, ever imagine. And so Abraham and Sarah, they want this son. Over 10 years goes by. They don't, they don't see anything happening. Nothing's happening at all. Can I say it like this? That just because you don't see anything happening doesn't mean that God isn't up to something. Just because it seems like nothing's working doesn't mean that something's not happening. Oh, I'm going to preach to myself today. Just because it feels like sometimes in nine years of being here, it's some, sometimes I feel like I've gone backwards, doesn't mean that God's not up to something. Alright, maybe I should take a, a, a run around here. Amen. I've had to encourage myself that God, even though I don't know what exactly is happening, God, you are moving, you are working, you're doing something, and so it's my job just to keep remain doing what I'm doing. Amen. You, may, you remain faithful unto God. Because you don't know what God's doing. I better encourage one of my friends. Many of you know him. Joel Demas this week. Just last Sunday, one of the young families that they've been witnessing to and who has been attending their church for several years, a young family, they have not totally, uh, totally come in yet, but they've been coming faithfully. And the young boy, 13 years old, uh, just was just baptized uh, on Easter Sunday morning uh, along with his mom and dad. He was at church last Sunday for the last time. He and his mom and dad got into an argument and had walked out of the house just after 6 o'clock last Sunday. They found him dead Wednesday. 13-year-old boy committed suicide. My heart, I've had complete nightmares this week. Not that I know the family, but knowing all the effort. What all that my friend has put, invested into this family. And my heart went out because a lot of times, some of the people that I've invested into the most have hurt me the worst. And I had just began to talk to him and saying, I feel your pain. And one of the things is like you're going out of your way. I mean, being up, not even going to sleep when they were, they were looking for this child. And being there with them until 2 o'clock in the morning, just getting a few hours of sleep through this whole process. I, I just can't imagine. And I had asked him the other day, and I'm like, you're not even guaranteed that they're even going to be here. He goes, no, six weeks ago, they said as soon as mom graduates, which was supposed to be next week, that they're leaving me. And so as a pastor thinking about, oh dear God, he's there ministering and helping this family. And all these people from Mississippi have now come down. And uh, the reply was yesterday is that they're going to have their service at his pool because that was where Zayden was baptized. And I had told Joel then, I said, well, Joel, 
you've already been ministering and talking to this family and he's been ministering to them and sharing the gospel to them. I say, you don't know. You don't know. They want to come back to where Zayden was baptized. You don't know. Be sensitive to those that want to be baptized and minister to their needs too. Even though you're not guaranteed to receive the harvest of that. But what that seed can do is go back to Mississippi and that they can link them into another church. Because you and I, we have to think as a God, but I want them. Oh, absolutely. I want their souls. I would love to have numbers in the church. But what am I doing here today? Still just casting the seed. I'm just, we keep doing what we're doing. And I'll tell you today that there are people that even listen to these messages every single week that don't even attend this building. But what encourages me is not only is it for you, but it's for those who are listening to the message even right now. Sure. That it's ministering to them and helping me. And we get text messages over it. So if you think I'm just discouraged and want to quit just because of who's here and who's not here, you have to understand today, it's the Word of God. God lays it upon our heart. We deliver it and it's for whosoever will. Amen. And thank God for technology today. I mean, imagine 20 some years ago, 30 some years ago, we didn't have what we have today to be able to minister. And so we, yes, you'd feel like quitting and giving up. But it doesn't matter today because it's not just for us, but it can go out. Some of the messages that thousands of people have clicked on and, and have heard. That's the encouragement. What is it? It's that seed. Even though I can't, I have no idea what's going on. And so decades have passed. You don't see it. And just because you don't see anything doesn't mean that God isn't, uh, that, that God isn't doing something. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that God isn't doing it. Just like a seed that goes into the ground. There's no tree yet. Where's the seed? Where's the tree? I placed a seed into the ground, came back, and there's no tree. There's nothing there. But that doesn't mean that God's not working on that seed. That seed was planted. And then what happens? There's rain that happens. There's sun that is happening. That, that seed has to die out so that it can be opened and so that roots can form. God is working on the seed. The Bible says that some what? Plant. And some water. But God. All we we're concerned about is the increase. It's God. God said you plant. Maybe your calling is to water. I'm the one. Oh. I told you today, thank you for coming to, to Jason's message. Jason's <laughs> message. Amen. Before you see the fruit, God is growing the root. Before you ever see anything happening, God is growing something that no one else can see. Before you see fruit, God is growing the root. Abraham had the same problem that we have. And that was that his perspective was so stinking limited. Limited perspective. And yet he finds himself in the tent. We know that. In the tent. Telling God what he doesn't see. Abraham was telling God, I can't see anything. He was inside the tent. You can't see great things when you're stuck into a small tent. And he's telling God, I don't see it happening. And he was in the tent. God, you're not doing what I wanted. You're not giving me what, what I expected. Can I tell you like this, that if God met all your expectations, he'd never have a chance to exceed them. If God met all your expectations, He'd never have a chance to exceed them. Abraham's in the tent telling God what he doesn't see. 
And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, verse number 5, Then the Lord took Abraham outside. You're inside, surrounded by four walls trying to tell me what you can't see. We're trying to tell me what I can't do. Abraham, I'm calling you out of the tent. You got to come out of the tent. You got to come out of those four walls because I want to show you something great. I want to show you th something spectacular. And so the Lord meets Abraham who is limited and he takes him outside to be able to show him. Take him outside to show him something greater. See, your thoughts are not God's thoughts. You're in a tent. God's ways are not your ways because you're stuck into a tent. As, he as the heavens are higher than the earth, the Bible says, are so are His ways. God is so much bigger than what we ever could imagine. And we get stuck into a tent. The Lord took Abraham outside and said, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many your descendants will have. Oh, but it's silent. I don't see it. You're thinking, ah, a son. And yet the Lord is thinking about nations. He's just thinking about, I just want, Lord, you promised me this. And yet God's like, oh yeah, I've got this to give to you. Abraham's thinking, like, I just want a, a son. But yet, today, you and I, who have been grafted into this, we're one of those stars. And the very seed of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says it like this. That if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Amen. Here's a man who is discouraged because waiting for a promise, wanting to have a child, a son. And God said, I have given you a promise, but it's going to blow your mind, Abraham, about the seed that you really are going to have. You're thinking about just one. I've got thousands upon thousands upon millions of people that are going to be a descendant of you. Because if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Abraham's thinking of a son. But God was thinking about you and I. You see, you never measure God's unlimited power by your limited expectations. No idea what God can do through a single seed planted in faith. Just because you don't see God working doesn't mean that He's not up to something. God is doing something and He is working. Even when you can't see it, He's working. So, He said, those who didn't have much faith, He said, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, He said, that you can say to this mountain, be removed. And what? I thought, so you tell me I can go to the Smoky Mountains and look at the mountain and say I've got enough faith and say, hey, dude, go to Hawaii. And the mountain just looks at it and goes, huh, I'm standing right here. <laughs> You see, I believe when we look at Jesus and His parables, He always took the natural. Know that there were mountains nearby. And he is, as He's ministering to them, He's like, I'm going to prove to you that there's nothing too hard. By the way, guys, if you have enough faith, see them, 
the mountain, it's a huge obstacle. You see, there are mountains in your life that are huge. And you can tell me what you're going through, and to me, it's just a small hill. Mountains are different in everybody's life. And so I believe today that Jesus was implying here not about literally moving like the Smoky Mountain to Hawaii, but rather that He was pointing out that if you'll have enough faith or whatever, whatever mountain that seems so big in your life, He can take care of it. He can literally take care of whatever big mountain is in your, your life. He said, don't grow weary. Remember that verse? So let's not get tired of doing what is good. Anybody get tired doing what's good? Lord, I'm tired. All these bad people seem like they're being blessed. I think I'm just going to go out and do something bad. I'm tired of doing good. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessings if we don't give up. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Because in due season, some of you are like, man, I've been waiting for that season to come. It's been too long of a season. God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. But I love, in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. I've been decades, over 10 years waiting for the promise. But Lord, I still believe you. And the Bible says it was counted to him as righteous he was made righteous because of his faith. Jesus says in John chapter 12 verse 24 and I'm closing. Very truly I tell you unless the kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it will produce many seeds. You see, the seed itself, singular, is ineffective. It is unfruitful. As long as it's preserved. As long as I play it safe, I should be fine. But if that single seed will just go into the ground and die. Die to myself. Die to my fleshly desires. If I will die out to me. That God, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. You have to understand, that's just that single seed. But if I will die out to the very fleshly desires of my life, that I don't know what could be produced out of me. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I never know who's watching. I don't know who's watching. And so I want to encourage you today that Abraham had faith. But it was, a, it was that seed of faith because he committed and he believed. He was made righteous. That here you and I are today. Multiplication of God's blessing. And so today I want to encourage us. If there is something that God is working in our life to, hey, I need you to die out to this. You need to listen to what God wants to do in your life and die out to it. God, I, I surrender my life to you. I give you my all. That today is going to be a new day in my life. I want to be that seed. 
it goes into the ground to die so that you can multiply and greater things can come in my life.